minor part. I couldn't find the melody to a song. I only know the part. And Grady said, Jeff, it doesn't matter. They're not listening to you anyway. Nobody does. I said, well, okay, thank you, Grady. The truth hurts just a little bit, so I was wounded, but not much. Uh, because of Veterans Day, we're going to do a couple of hymns to honor our veterans. So if you would turn over first to hymn number 634, you should know this one, My Country Tis of Thee. And it's short. Now, in my Sunday school, we had a little conversation. They said, why is it we get these hymns and you only do the Baptist approach of first, third, and fourth? So I cut a deal with my Sunday school member, and I said, okay. I'll meet you in the middle. One of the hymns will do all four, and the other hymn will do first, third, and fourth. And so we, we, met, we met in the middle, and so that's what we're going to do. All four verses of My Country, Tis of Thee. So if you'd like to turn over to 634. My... of the sweet land of liberty of thee I sing land where my fathers died land of the pilgrims pride from every mountainside let freedom ring my native country the Let music swell the breeze and ring from all the trees, sweet freedom song. Let mortal tongues awake, let all that breathe partake, let rocks the high silence break, the sound prolong. Number four. Our a page and you will see number 630 but look at the bottom of, of what is basically listed as God's promise to you is freedom it's listed as 632 read along with me God's promise to you is freedom and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free if the son therefore shall make you free ye shall be free indeed Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants for God. Kind of defines what freedom is and God's promise to us. Number 630, America the Beautiful. And before we go, just pay special attention when we get to verse number 3. And let the words sink in as we sing them. So, number 630, America the Beautiful. skies for amber waves of gray for purple mountains majesties See 
with me for just a moment. Lord, we thank you so much for your blessings. We thank you so much for letting us be here. Lord, we thank you so much to take the opportunity to stop and reflect and think upon the blessings of liberty that you have extended to us, even though, as Pastor Ken said last week, we are a stiff-necked people, yet still you bless us, yet still you shed your grace on us. Lord, we stop during this moment to particularly identify and extend our appreciation and love to those veterans who gave so much, who give so much, Lord, and to those we give you thanks. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for it's in your precious name. Everybody says, amen. Amen. I don't know how many of you remember <clears throat> years ago in Chattanooga, they used to have a parade like that. I don't know, do they still have that? Does anybody get to go to that this year? It was always on Friday. They even let the kids out of school half a day on Friday so that they could go see the Veterans Day parade. And then uh, when I came to this church, there were so many, so many people who had served in World War II. You heard the stories of those uh, you know, the things that happened and, and uh, fighting in the South Pacific and the different places like that. And it was so intriguing to hear those. Of course, a lot of those have gone on to be with the Lord. But were there are still those who are around who have served and honored us by fighting for us, for each and every one of us, for our freedom. So at this time, I want to ask if you have served or are, are serving, would you please stand so we can give you a, a round of applause? Yeah. Thank you. 
I hope you sense the gratitude of those around you for what you've done for us as you fought. <clears throat> if you, uh, and you, luckily you came home safe. There's so many who did it. And of course, we remember those on Memorial Day. There's so many times that we can honor you, and we uh, hope that you feel honored even today. Uh, I'm going to ask you, if you will, to uh, bow, and I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up, and we'll begin our worship this morning. Just as Jeff said, Lord, we pray and we thank you for our veterans, those who fought in my place. And Lord, it's just a, almost a, a symbol of what Jesus did on the cross for us. He died for us. And Lord, I thank you for their selfless act of fighting for us, for our freedom. And uh, so many of us have not had a chance to serve and, and uh, show our appreciation. But I pray that the, these who have served will feel the appreciation from our heart. And Lord, just thank you that... Uh, the battle that has been won for us in freedom is a great battle that has been bought, fought for our freedom for eternity. And we thank you for the victory that has been won by Jesus Christ on the cross. And we pray that we would worship you in spirit and truth today and honor you with our voices, honor you with our hearts. Lord, may we just get lost in who you are today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you guys would go ahead and stand with us. my friend
for this next song, uh, it's kind of like a prayer. Um, so just want to, you know, open it up. If you want to stand, if you want to sit, if you want to, uh, you know, kneel down and pray, just whatever you feel, um, just come to the altar again.
Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have promised us that one day we will spend eternity with you if we've accepted the blood of Jesus Christ as the payment for our sin. What a glorious day that will be. But Lord, I pray that even as we look forward to that day, that each and every day we will recognize that we've been put on this earth to honor you, to serve you, to give you praise, even today. So today, let it be the day that we give you praise. May we see your face, face to face. May you not see this servant, but may we see your face. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I want to go ahead and apologize. I was up a lot most of the night coughing last night. This time of year, it just kills me every year when it changes temperature. And so I, I, even when I was sitting there, I, didn't, I wasn't singing. And it's amazing. I love hearing everybody sing. But sometimes just focus on the words of the songs that we're singing. And actually, if you look at the words that we sang this morning, you, I can just close the book because it's a lot of the sermon that we're going to be hearing this morning. And uh, so this morning, uh, today we're going to be studying a book that I'm sure that everybody here uh, until today probably could tell me nothing about, right? In fact, let me ask you, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but how many of you read through the Bible at least one time all the way through? Some of us three or four times. Even if I ask those who've read it three or four times, what is the book of Nahum about? Could you tell me? No. And you call yourself a Christian. <laughs> the Jonah that Jonah wanted to give. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It is the sermon that Jonah wanted to give. It is the sequel of Jonah. But uh, it, it's so funny that, uh, uh, in fact, if you're a Christian here today and you can't tell me anything about Nahum, then you qualify to be on staff here because I think none of us could probably tell you about Nahum as well. In fact, if I didn't know any better, I would think that Brother Ken took the right opportune times to leave, to not be able to be here. Last time I got Joe Ash. How many of you had ever heard of Joe Ash and Joe Haida? You know, that was one that was hard. And then even after me, uh, Dylan got Isaiah. That's cool. And he had Jonah last week. I get Nahum. Who's Nahum? Nobody, even know, nobody names their kids after Nahum or Joe Ash or Joe Haida. Yeah, all right. Anyway, that's where we are today, and so if you will, take your Bibles, and if you will, turn to the front of your Bible and look up in the index, because find Nahum on there and find the page number and go there, because if you're going to try to flip through there, you're probably not going to find it. It's in the back of the Old Testament. It's a minor prophet, and it's probably just two pages, and if you're, if it's probably like your Bible. It's got pages that are being on the top or whatever, then they're probably stuck together, and you probably would flip right by it. So find the Nahum, and that's where we're going to be. We're going to look at, actually, it's three chapters, so we're going to look at all three chapters, and uh, we'll start there today. So uh, last week, we saw that Jonah went to, to Nineveh to preach to the Ninevites, and of course, he didn't want to, and when he got there, the Ninevites repented, God relented, and Jonah was offended, or offended, sorry. I tried to make it rhyme a little bit there. Yeah, he, they repented, and God repent, uh, relented, and then Jonah was offended. So now we're looking at 150 years later, and we come to Nahum. And so it's around 630 B.C., somewhere around there, 630, 650, something like that B.C. And the Syrian dynasty is really in charge of the whole known world at that time. You know, through the years you see the different dynasties, the Greek dynasty, the Roman dynasty, the the Babylonian dynasty, uh, the Medes, the different times. Well, this is the time during the Assyrian uh, dynasty. And uh, it, actually, the Assyrians would conquer these cities, and they were known to be extremely brutal, extremely barbaric. The, they were downright evil. And uh, if you were to look at some of the things that they have found since they found parts of Nineveh, there's been writings that they found from generals, from kings, and that sort of thing, and it, that talks about some of the things that they would do to the cities or the, the areas that they would conquer, and uh, some of the things like uh, they would be, you know, cut their heads off. Well, you say, well, they do that in the Middle East nowadays. Well, they would cut off on hands and arms and legs and toes, and then they would, they would start putting a pile of, of feet over there, a pile of, 
uh, hands over here, or foul legs over here. It was kind of really brutal. It talks about sometimes how they would conquer a city and take the dead that they had killed and line the streets with them, build walls with the bodies. It talks about how they burned people alive. You say, well, we've done that in Winston-Salem in the United States, yeah? They would actually fillet people or skin them. They were just very brutal and wicked. They would, wicked. They would actually torture their victims before they killed them, and they bragged about it. They would even take some of the body parts and hang them in the cities to say, you know, this is what we do, and if you don't do what we say, this could happen to you as well. So the people in that area, you know, including Israel, were very aware of the oppression of the Assyrians. They were afraid. And do you know what the capital of this Assyrian regime was? Nineveh. The same town that we, tar- that we talked about last week that Jonah went to and tried to get them and got them to repent. And God relented and he, re- he uh, let them go and he took their destruction away from them. And then now there's 150 years later, and they've forgotten everything that God had done. I don't know if they didn't tell their kids or if they just forgot. In some ways, I think that, okay, they received grace. Last week, we learned that they had received some grace. And uh, they didn't receive the justice that they deserved. You know, and I think that's a lot like us as well. Sometimes when we we see grace in our lives, we just kind of forget about it. It's just there. But when we see justice happen, we kind of remember those kind of things. I don't think they received the justice that they did, and because of that, they kind of fell back in to the same things that they had been going through for many years. You know, so many people want to focus on the mercy and grace and, and the love of God, but we have to remember that there's an other side, another aspect of God that we forget a lot of times. And that's the justice of God, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. You know, I joke about this little book, and uh, there's also a lot of little books called the Minor Prophets there toward the end of the, the Old Testament, but they're all part of God's revelation of himself to us. And so as we read this, we need to think about what is a characteristic that we can see from the book of Nahum. Now, this is a time when Israel and Judah uh, are under the king, actually Josiah is king in Judah, and we know what happened in Josiah. They found the book of the law in the temple, and they started reading it in the streets. People were turning to God. So things were going well for Israel, except they were under the oppression of the Assyrians, and they were without hope. So Nahum comes along, and this is kind of a a letter or prophecy of hope for Israel. Now, as we read this, and I'm going to read the first uh, three verses of each chapter, Maybe a little bit more in chapter 3. So if you're in Nahum, turn to chapter 1, and we'll start there. Nahum chapter 1, verse 1. An oracle concerning Nineveh. And that's important. I'll talk about that in a minute. The book of the vision of Nahum of Elkosh, or Elkosh. Some of your Bibles may say the Elkoshite. Almost sounds like a fictional town in Star Wars or something. The Lord is jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is the whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Then in chapter 2, the scatterer has come up. Joseph, can you turn me down a little bit? I'm kind of ringing. The scatterer has come against you. Man the ramparts, watch the road, dress for battle, collect all your strength, for the Lord is restoring the majesty of Jacob as the majesty of Israel, for plunderers have plundered them and ruined their branches. The shield of his mighty men is red, his soldiers are clothed in scarlet, the the chariots come come with flashing metal on the day he musters them, the cypress spears are brandished. And then in chapter 3, woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder, no end to the prey, the crack of the whip and rumble of the wheel, galloping horse and bounding chariot, horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering spear, hosts of slain, heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end, they stumble over the bodies, 
and all for the countless whorings of the prostitute, graceful and of deadly, graceful and of deadly charm, who betrays nations with her whorings and people with her charms. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will lift up your skirts over your face. I will make nations look at you, your nakedness. <coughs> Excuse me. And kingdoms at your shame. I will throw filth at you and treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. And all who look at you will shrink from you and say, Wasted is Nineveh. Who will grieve for her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? You know, as we read this, you know, people are tempted today to say, okay, this is an oracle to Nineveh. It's Nineveh's wicked. It's a, 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 a prophecy of what's going to happen to Nineveh. It's written to, for the Israelites so that they might take comfort in knowing that this oppressor is going to cease. Well, some of us may look at today and try to put today's, uh, put it in today's context. In other words, uh, okay, who is the wicked country today? Who, who is it that uh, is evil and does these kind of things? You know, some people will say it's Al-Qaeda or ISIS or some of those different things, or North Korea or Russia or someone like that. And, of course, we always say that Israel is, is God's church in America, Israel, his chosen people. I like how one pastor put it. You might want to write this down. Nineveh and Israel are symbols of Nineveh and Israel. It's written to the Israelites with a, an oracle about Nineveh, what's going to happen. Don't try to add things to it that are not there. Now, as I said earlier, these little books are written for us to glean something about God. And so we learn a lot about God, even in the first chapter of Nahum. So let's look at that. In the first verse, it says, actually in verse 2, it says, the Lord is a jealous God. We see that he's a jealous God. Now, we get jealousy and envy mixed up so many times. Envy is when you, are, you desire something that somebody else has. I'm envious of them. They have this, they have that, or whatever. Jealous is when you already have something. So when God is jealous, he's jealous over what he has, his creation, those who are accepted him, those who, who believe in him and follow him. He's jealous, and he's telling Ninevites, hey, I don't want anybody to hurt what I have. I, the only example I could think of is when I was younger, I built a bridge over a creek behind my house. Uh, I cut some trees down and put them across this creek, and I put boards across it so that I could get my go-kart to the other side so there's a big field over there so I could ride. So I built this, and I was so proud of it. And one day I come down, and there was a guy from down the street who was taking the boards off of it. And I thought he was a friend of mine. But my blood boiled because that was my creation. That was something I had made, and I was jealous of it. I didn't want anything to hurt it. And there was wrath, I'll tell you that. Okay, But that's the way God feels. If you've ever made something and you, you cherished it, God we are his, and he loves us, and he doesn't want anything. So he's telling the Ninevites, hey, <laughs> you've messed up because these are my people, and I'm a jealous God. It also says that he is an avenging God, a just God. A God is slow to anger, but is great in power, and one day will take it no longer. In Jonah 4.2, it also talks about how God is a slow to anger. It doesn't say he doesn't get angry. It just says he's slow to anger. And one day, he's going to say, I've had enough. And that's what he's doing here. To the Ninevites, he said, you've done this for too long. I gave you 150 years to get it right. I've had enough. And so the day of the Lord is coming. We, the Bible calls it the day of the Lord. And it is a day of reckoning. And it is coming, and it's coming for every one of us. Just as we say, there will be a day when we'll all bow before him. There is a day. And uh, so, you know, if you are a Bible-believing, God-loving, God-fearing person who does his best to serve or, and, and love the Lord and honor him and be obedient to him, then you should love this sermon. 
If you're someone who's spitting in the face of God, and I know there's probably nobody here saying that there is no God, I feel for you. There is a day coming when there will be judgment. You know, we typically hear of Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, which is all what God is to us a lot of times. He's our banner. He's our healer. He's our uh, provider. But very few times do we hear about Elohe Mishpat. Elohe Mishpat is the God of justice. So as we look at this, we can see that God is a God of justice. He's also a God of mercy. He's a God of love and slow to anger. And it also says that he is great in power. And it's interesting that Nahum even has to write this to the Israelites, that he's great in power. Shouldn't they know that already? Shouldn't the Israelites know all the things that he's done for them, even from Egypt on? They should know all that. He's great in power, but they've forgotten. And so now when they're under the oppression of the other, of Assyria, they're, they're frightened. They're worried. They have forgotten that God is great in power. Well, I believe that there's some people here today that are maybe in that situation where they don't realize all the things that are going on around them. They're fearful. In this world of what is happening, and you see the world and you know falling around us. Let me remind you, God is a God of great power. And there's no better place for us to be than in his refuge. Right? Throughout this chapter, verse chapter, it describes the God of justice, name describes the God of justice. In verse Three, it says he's whirlwind in a storm. In verse four, he rebukes the seas and makes it dry. He goes on and says he dries up all the rivers. Spoiler alert, just to let you know, 50 years after this prophecy was written, Nineveh, this huge city with eight miles of fortified walls, it was huge and had a great infrastructure. 50 years after this, what was prophesied come to be. And it was hard to get into that city, but how do you think, and it was conquered by the Babylonians and the Medes, how do you think they got into the city? They dammed up the river that goes through the city, and they came in on dry. He dried up the river so that these, the armies could come through, and they came through in the dry riverbeds. And in verse 2, it says that, that his soldiers are clothed in scarlet. Guess what the Babylonians wore under their armor? Red robes, just proving that this prophecy took place, and it came, came to be. And uh, if you're like me, you, in my human nature, you see the evilness going around, and you say, Lord, why are they prospering? Why are they succeeding? And, and, and I think that's what Nahum is doing it for the Israelites as well, saying, you know, I know that you see this is going on, but what I want to tell you is one day I will judge the wicked. God will judge the, uh, the wicked. And Nahum actually means comforter. So he was coming to give the Israelites uh, the fact that God is going to do something. You don't have to worry about taking revenge yourself. And we've heard that. We've been taught that. You don't have to take worry, worry about that because I'm going to do it myself. Those who are unrepentant, those who spit in the face of God will face total, unhindered whirlwind of God's wrath. What is that? Hell. A lot of people don't like to hear about hell anymore. But it's a real place. And it's a place of punishment for those who have not accepted what God has done for them. Because he is just. There is a place called hell. Well, even in the mess, midst of this message, you can see where you see another aspect of God, and that's in verse, look at verse 7. Verse 7, it says, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. Look at the second part of, of verse 12. Though I have afflicted you, Israel, I will afflict you no more. And now I will break his yoke from off of you and will burst your bonds apart. He's given them hope. Behold, upon the mountains, the feet of him who brings good news. Who do you think that is? Who publishes peace? 
Keep your feast, O Judah. Fulfill your vows. For never again shall the worthless pass through you. He is utterly cut off. Now, this is talking about Nineveh. We, all, we know that later on, Babylon came, Babylonia came and took them to captivity. <coughs> but right now, this is against Nineveh, and this is a book against Nineveh. So he is both wrathful and he is merciful. But uh, uh, what I believe he's doing is he's giving Israel a sense of hope. What he's saying is, hold on to me. Come into my stronghold. It says, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. He knows those who come under the fold of Jesus, of God. Right? Some people will focus on the wrath of ju and justice of God only, and they'll think of God as this uh, tyrant God who just wants to step on us when we mess up. Some people will go the completely opposite end and say, you know, God's a God of love and mercy and peace. He wants me to be happy. God never promised us happiness. He promised, he wants us to live holy as he is holy. Okay? So we have to look at, there. he's two aspects of God, mercy and justice. justice. But to us, I think he's saying, hold on. Be faithful. You may not see it now, but one day they will have their day in court. You see, we have to be clear. God hates sin. And they were chief sinners. They were evil. And those people that we see around us that are evil, one day will have their day in court. They will stand before God and every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. They'll see Jesus. They'll stand before him. He hates sin, and if you're an unrepentant sinner, you're turned your back on God, you don't want to be obedient, and you want to live the life you want to do it, the way you want to do it, then you're an enemy of God. In chapter 3, he says, woe to the bloody city. This whole chapter is a conviction of what God's going to do to the Ninevites, and every bit of it came true, okay? But it begins with a blow, I mean a woe. A lot of people say that, you know, oh, whoa, that's cool. No, woe is a bad, it's a curse. Woe to that bloody city. Woe unto you. Woe. And if you're one of those who are, is an evil person, uh, and, uh, you know, like I said, I hope there's nobody here. And somebody may be listening. I hope somebody gets to hear this message. If you've turned your back on God or you've turned away from God and you're not following what God wants you to do and you're living a life of evil, of wickedness, then woe to you. Woe to you. Unless you return or turn to God. Return or turn to God. As I said, this is a time when Josiah is king and Israelites have gone through some wicked times. Actually, God was using, and he used throughout the Old Testament, he used all other armies to punish or to, uh, to give them what they deserved because they turned their back on God. And Nineveh is one of those cities that he used, or one of those uh, nations that he used. And, uh, but now they are focusing on tearing down the Asherah poles. They, they're hearing God's word again, and they're, they've turned back to the Lord, and now God wants to give them hope. And that's why he sent Nahum to give this to him. And uh, as I said earlier, we have to be careful of putting our names in there. This is for Nineveh and Israel. And so th as we see this book, he see, we see the character of God. And here we see that he is just to the wicked. And he's merciful to those who are his. Those who run into his stronghold. Those that he knows. Now, I don't know about how you feel about punishment. Uh, you know, I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, God... Yeah, he's forgiving. He's faithful and just to forgive us if we we'll confess our sins, right? But it also says in the Bible that just like a father who loves his son will give him discipline. So I believe in the discipline of God. I believe that there are natural consequences of our sin. I believe that there's things that happen because of our sin that, that are just part of the punishment of what we've, we've done. 
I believe that the, if nothing else, just the conviction of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. When we've done something wrong and we have the Holy Spirit in our heart, I, it's, it's not a happy time. And I think that's part of the punishment of God. And I think there are things, I think maybe sometimes when we are not being obedient or doing whatever, I think we miss out on blessings. And that's part of the punishment of God. And that's justice because he's a just God, right? But that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is being an enemy of God. Nahum says he takes vengeance on his adversary. What is an adversary? His enemies. Well, who are his enemies? If you will, turn with me to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, and look at verse 4. And he's talking about those who, are, who have gotten caught up in the world. They're fighting and doing stuff among them, among uh, uh, the people. And he says, <clears throat> in chapter 4, he says, you adulterous people. In other words, you're my bride. Why are you hanging out with other people? You're my bride. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, who wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And he, listen, the Bible tells us that each and every one of us at one point in our lives are enemies of God. We've all done the things of the world and turned our back on God in some way or another. Are we doomed? I've got good news for you. Guys, can you raise the screen for me? You think about the evilness and wickedness that has been a part of our lives. That ought to move you. It moves me. Because in Romans 5.10, it says that while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. We were reconciled to God through his son. And knowing that each and every one of us are an enemy and that God is a just God who avenges his enemies, knowing that there had to be justice because God is a just God. Somebody had to pay for the wickedness, for the evilness that is in our hearts. And Jesus died on the cross. Because God is just. You see, if God wasn't just, there would be no need for Jesus. If God wasn't just, there would be no need for the cross. God is a just God. And he paid the price for us, for our wickedness. And yes, he did it for the wicked as well. If they will turn or go into his stronghold, so that he knows them. How do we go into that stronghold? As we accept the covering of blood that God gave us through Jesus Christ. How could you be against God when you understand that? When you understand, how could you continue to live in wickedness and, and do evil when you understand what Jesus did to satisfy the justice of God. If you will, turn to Hebrews chapter 10. And I don't know why God keeps giving me this. I talked about it the last time I preached. And, uh, and just for some reason it keeps coming up. But it goes really well with what we've talked about today. Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 19 through 31. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter... The holy place by the blood of Jesus, only by the blood of Jesus, we can go into his stronghold. 
Enter the holy place of blood by Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, that's Jesus, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Hold on, hold on. Fill our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir on, uh, stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. What's that day? The day of the Lord. The day of the wrath, of God's wrath. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. And that's a lifestyle. You going on saying, I don't care what God says. I'm going to do what I want to do. But a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. The what? The adversaries. The enemies. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. And he's talking about the Old Testament before Jesus. Then he says, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has spurned the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he is sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So today, if you're someone who's living a life of sin, continual choosing to live a life of sin, woe to you. If you know someone who has just turned their back on God and just is away from them, it is important, it's imperative for us to Bring them back into the, the stronghold of God because there is going to be a day of Jesus, of judgment. You know what? One of the things that uh, I think we forget so many times is when we see the cross and we know what God has done for us through Jesus, it should cause us to want to honor God and repent, turn from our wicked ways. Yes, we're going to mess up. And God is faithful and just to forgive them if we confess our sins. It's what he tells us. But there are so many people in this world, and I see them every day. They say, oh, I can do this and still be a Christian. Oh, can you? Have you read the Bible? There are things that people in this world have got it all wrong because they are of this world. So today, I hope this has taught us something of how we might go forward forward in our lives with our lives because God is not only a God of grace and mercy God is a God of justice and we see that through the book of Nahum let's pray Father this is I have to admit this was a difficult message because we always want to focus on your love and your mercy and your peace and this is kind of hard, but Lord, we know that the justice that you have is true. And because you sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross, you satisfied that judgment. And so therefore, it is a greatest act of mercy and love as well. And Lord, I pray, Lord, I pray that if there's somebody who's heard this message that has, has wandered away from God or has never been uh, come to the Lord, Lord, that they would realize that he is good, and he knows those who come into his stronghold. Lord, I pray that today would be the day that they surrender themselves and their lives to you, to following your will and your way, from turning from the worldly sins and, uh, so that we might not be called adulteresses. Lord, we're yours. We don't want to give our love to another. So, Lord, I pray that today each and every one of us would take it upon ourselves to see 
that the world around us, those people, no matter what they may be doing to us or uh, what evil they're doing and yet prospering, Lord, there is a day of judgment, but that also should hurt us. It should want us to go to them and share with them and say, you need to surrender. Surrender your heart to Jesus. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to go into a time of invitation. If you're here today and maybe you've seen the world around you and you think it's not fair. It's just not fair, Lord. I hope that you have gained some solace that uh, he's going to be the judge of them. But I hope that it's also given you a desire to share the gospel with an evil world so that they may too come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you need to come and you need to say, Lord, I've never done that. I want to be in your stronghold. I want to be in your care. I want you to be jealous over me. Will you come? Maybe you need to join the church and be a part of the family. Whatever it is God's calling you to do, will you come this morning as we see our invitation?
thank you for the message that you give us throughout your word. Lord, it just gives us aspects of who you are. Lord, sometimes it doesn't seem as pleasing to us, so heartwarming to us, but it is part of your character. But Lord, I do thank you that because you are a just God, you made a way. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the cross where you paid the punishment for my sins, where you avenged your enemies, where you gave us justice through Jesus. You gave us mercy as well. Lord, we love you, and we want to leave this place telling the world about your justice and about your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.